So Mike will be speaking directly on time, and then Scott will be coming up straight after. So welcome, Mike. Good morning, everybody. Um, look, uh, what I talk about nowadays is the fact that the internet's connected everything together, and what's happening in reality is we can source anything we want, uh, whether it be uh, customers, products, services, or now people anywhere in the world at world's best value, and that's changing the business models of waters. The Philippines. I have a little bit to do with the Philippines. I live up there nowadays. I've been running tours up there for a couple of years, um, um, teaching everybody. 105 million people. The median age is 23.3 years, and this boy. Two thirds of them are less than 15 years of age. They are reading their workers of the future. <laughs> Understatement of the year. You get a lot of Catholics, it's wonderful. 93% of them are literacy right? well educated, using English. Third largest English speaking country in the world. 92.5% are Christian, so they see it, share, share the uh, very similar values to us. By the way, 88 point uh, something percent of them are Catholic, and they're more Catholic than the Vatican. Quite an amazing place. Workforce of 39 million people, half a million uh, college graduates a year. 16, uh, the, the industry, the offshore <coughs> industry, is worth $16 billion US at the moment, and it's growing at about about 20% a year. The uh, shot of buildings in the background there, this is actually taken from my apartment in Manila, that's my swimming pool just there. Um, that shot there, that's the Fort Bonifacio, that did not exist seven years ago. All those buildings there with cranes on a pre style The growth up there is enormous, and that's one of many areas around Manila that are growing and building at that speed. Absolutely amazing the growth there. Got strong government backing, good solid foundations for the industry. Currently, there's 1.2 million Filipinos employed servicing Western businesses. 75% of them work for USA businesses. So 75% of them start at 10 o'clock at night and finish at 4 o'clock in the morning. If we come along and say, we want you to start at 6 o'clock in the morning and finish 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they think the sun shines out of that idea. Uh, they're on the Western um, Australian time zone, so they're, they're trip that two hours off from here. There's roughly 150,000 at the moment working for Australian businesses and that is wrapping up fast. We believe it's wrapping up a lot faster than 20 percent a year. The growth up there from Australian businesses are a thing. The challenge for everybody is not education, it's not English. The challenge for everybody is they are very, very Americanized. They're very one-eyed, they only see American things. I've got them there, I've got them up there selling removals for my mini movers business, and we have to teach them what they are foot partners because they only know all the sidewalkers. And they're very, very bad for us. It's probably the biggest challenge up there at the moment. Okay, we're not doing anything here. Well, there we are, sorry. Okay, so typical gross wages, this is what they pay, gross wages, not what they cost. Uh, we pay them a thousand pesos per month. So when we talk to each other, I say, Scotty, what are you paying? We say 20 or 15 or 16. And we'll talk <coughs> the first number on, on this thousand pesos per month. Housemaids, and I have a full time housemaid now, 3,000 pesos a month. That is $17 per week. If you want to know what she does with the money, she sends it all home to the provinces where it feeds about five or six different people. Right. Security guards running around 7,038. Now, this is where the interesting things are. This is the BPO industry, the outsourcing industry. We've come in and we're paying inflated wages compared to the local wages. If you were in Manila in a standard clerical office role working for the Philippines government or a large Philippines national company, you would be being paid 8,000 pesos per month, which is $45 per week. If you are working for us in the BPO industry in exactly the same role, we would be paying you 22,000 pesos per month, which is $125 per week. So just think of somebody here earning, say, $800 a week, and somebody from Japan comes in and says, we'll pay you $1,800 a week. What would you think of that? Well, that's exactly what they think about, okay? And that's, that's the discarded things that they there. Uh, we offshore because of lower wages and lower office costs. That's the primary reason that's driving us up there. It's what we're doing with it that's interesting. When we offshore, we obviously do it to add to our profits. We do that by direct <coughs> wage savings. Everybody can see that. But most of us, once we get up there and get going, very, very quickly work out there's a whole lot of other stuff we can do as well. We all add to our business office, office 
I don't know if you know my history, but I put mini movements up there about three years ago. Uh, I currently have 45 people in mini movements in the Philippines at the moment. Um, and I have other business interests up there as well now. But um, we, we added to our business office offer, we added um, different products into it in our mix when we got up there and could start doing that. We improved and we added more processes in. Our marketing processes have changed dramatically once we got up there. And we've also dramatically increased our customer experiences because of what we can afford to do in the Philippines. Um, it gave us access to high productivity. Most of my Philippine staff are way, way more productive than my Australian staff. Right? My salespeople there outconvert my Australian salespeople easily, consistently. Um, you can use it to develop new businesses. There's quite a few people in the room here that have come up and, and now developed new businesses going up there. And it's a great conduit into overseas markets. And I'm developing a business in the USA right at the moment. And I'm doing it out of the Philippines because it's natural for them to sell and get involved with the USA. So it's a great place to do it. Okay, how can you offshore? Fundamentally, there's five different ways, five different things you need to think about. The first one is you can incorporate and do it yourself. The same as you do here, you can incorporate a company, list some premises, hire some people. Do not do that. Before you do that, talk to anybody who's gone up there and done it. Trust us. It is beyond belief. I'm not even going to begin to describe it here. It is nothing like you think it is. And if you do it for less than 30 or 35 people, you're crazy. It's just simply not worth it. So don't do that. Um, we are still getting, I'm still getting people coming up and incorporating five people and getting into all sorts of strife. Um, it's crazy. Just don't do that, but you can do it if you want to. Um, please, you can use a third party to host your people. That's what most of us do. There's staff leasing, there's seat leasing, there's whole various ways you can do it, but most of us use a third party as the employer and <coughs> then um, uh, and, 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 and to provide the office space that saves us the, to do the incorporation doing that so you can use the third party to run a structured process that's the traditional way outsourcing was done that's how the industry started 20 years ago that's where it all got a bad name um, I'm still getting people from EOs and, and, and that size businesses going up there going to some of the big corporates and doing that they often get into strife there's still some problems around doing that Unless you've got extremely structured processes that are proven, do not do it. And I'm seeing people coming up without processes, going into these guys saying, oh, we'll develop the process. No, you need a proven process before you can do it. Uh, you can use an online facility, ODESK. I still, I'm still an ODESK fan. I have been for years. I still use it for various things. ODESK, freelancer, all those sort of things. You can use that. Or you can, uh, uh, you can off, off, offshore outsource to a specialised service. Um, the common one is accountancy, um, but marketing, just about all those services. The type of services you can typically outsource to in Australia, you can outsource to up there. And in Australia, most of us would outsource our accountants, um, and indeed you can do it up there. And I'll show you some slides around that in just a minute. No, you don't have to go up to the Philippines. Yes, it helps, but if you're really serious, then it really helps. No, in two days you will not fully understand the traps and opportunities. And uh, should I bring them to Australia? Yes, once you hire them, you should bring them to Australia. The most efficient way to train them by far is to bring them here. It only costs you an airfare, you put them in your house, your feet, and it doesn't cost you anything to do that. Bring them down for four to six weeks, it works beautifully. Okay, I'm going to talk about staff leasing a little bit because it's the one that's booming and it's the one that a lot of people in this room are involved in doing and everything else. Um, typically it's seven to nine dollars an hour, that's all up office and full wages. It's very, very quick to start up. It's a very quick way to start up. It's using a third party uh, to do it. It's low risk. You can ramp up or down size at will. You can start with one seat and go to hundreds, it's not a problem. Think like they your landlord. That's the best way to view it. They provide the infrastructure, the office space, desk, and computer. They legally employ, providing recruitment and HR services. Right? You nominate what you need and how many you, you want to interview. Right? Just like a recruitment agency, I'll have one of those, this much experience, whatever you want to do. Right? Then you do that and then you do the final recruitments and you select the one you want. Right? You have a say in salary and bonuses with most of them, not all of them, but most of them you do. You select your people at the end of the day. They engage and sit them in front of the desk for you to instruct. They engage, sit them in front of the desk for you to instruct. So many of you get into trouble with staff leases because you think 
pick the stuff and they see people are going to do it for you. All they do is provide the human being sitting in front of the desk, unless they're specialising in something, okay? Um, they, they manage the behaviour, they manage them turning up on time, taking too many breaks, whether they should have, be, be off for a, 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 a far distant uncle's um, burial or funeral or something like that. They, be, they handle all that for you. You manage your workflow. So you have to manage them and their workflow. You can develop and finish your team. It's a brilliant way to start and build a team. And I will stress this, only a Filipino can manage a Filipino. Right? But you need an Aussie overseeing the whole thing. And that's the secret for it. But, um, specialised services, services we're normally outsourced to. It's trending from wholesale to retail, accounts, uh, CAD drawing, videoing, marketing, gaming, all that sort of stuff. They all have moved in recent times from in the last few years from a wholesale model to a retail model, and most of them are charging about $20 an hour. Right? You can get a full accountancy service up there for $17 an hour, um, that are, and those companies are only specialising in Australia, just in Australia. So that's happening now. What worked for me, I started small uh, to bed it down and to learn what I'm doing. I started with one employee for about six weeks, I put two employees on, and then very quickly after that, once I've got a pen, then I wrapped it all up to around 25 today. I have my people in my space with my culture. I have them in their own space, their own thing, and go inside, it looks like mini movers, it feels like mini movers, and they all believe they're working for mini movers. Uh, I use a third party post, which eliminates a whole stack of distractions that I don't want to get involved in. Mistakes, starting with the wrong structure for growth and or in the wrong location um, is a very, very common one. Getting a third party to run a process at arm's length without having proven, proven the processes. Expecting industry ready to go work is, guys, you won't get up there and get experienced people. You're going to have to create them. It's worth creating them because the savings are enormous and the reward is fantastic if you do that properly. Not understanding capabilities and limitations, they are extremely capable. You can get high end people up there if you're prepared to wait, find, hunt them, and pay them. You can get them. Um, but there are some limitations in what they can do. Um, misunderstanding English terms is probably one of the most common mistakes. A very quick story about that. When I first went up there, I didn't think they had holiday pay. I kept asking all the providers, you know, how much is the holiday pay? Do they have loading? And they kept saying, sir, we don't have holiday. We don't have holiday pay. No, no holiday pay. And it wasn't until about six, 12 months after, after about 12 months, somebody said something about vacation leave. Of course, we got vacation leave. Yeah, of course, we got vacation leave. <laughs> Those sort of mistakes are really common. First tours I took up there, everybody's up. Bookkeepers, which I've told there's no bookkeepers. Well, there aren't any bookkeepers up there. Why? Because there's a massive oversupply of accountants in the market, and the accountant, accountancy, trained accountancy grants are $84 a week. How cheap do you want to go for a bookkeeper? You know, crazy stuff. So you just, English terms is probably one of the biggest mistakes you can have up there. I often, I'm always meeting people, oh, I went up and had a look and I wanted one of these and I wanted quantities of ours and I couldn't get quantities of ours. No, they're a civil engineer with a different twist, a completely different name. But the number of people I've met that have gone up looking for something and said they don't have them. Yes, they do, they just call them something different. That's a big one, you need to understand that. Using our values around the type of office space and the type of income motivators uh, is another big mistake. Uh, you've got to culturally adjust. They think very, very different than we do. They work for their family, they don't work for themselves. The pay increase doesn't do much for them. You get more out of giving them a chocolate bar than you will out of giving them a dollar. And the biggest one is not connecting with your people up there. So, guys, um, that's it for time, I believe. You've got, you got a minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, here we go. Yeah, I'm going to take it. Next question. Very, very quickly, some of the strange things I'm seeing up there. There's a, an American business up there that has 900 data miners and all they're doing is going through the USA and high resolution maps and they're measuring roofs. They're putting red dots on the corners, right? And then they're recording the type of roof, the condition of the roof and the size of the roof. That's all they do. Want to build a database? It's a cool way to build a database, okay? I've got a guy here in Australia who sells something like a swimming pool. I've made a swimming pool here to show you. What he's doing with the Filipinos, they're going down the streets in Australia where they see a house with no swimming pool, right, and the backyard big enough for it. They actually take a screenshot, they turn it into a brochure, it says, is this your house? How about a pool in your backyard? They then cut that out, send it down here, mail it to the client, right, and then they're getting conversion rates fantastic on that, okay? 
want to target your marks, that's how you target it. Oh, having a in the morning. Okay, this is Brisbane Dudley. Um, it's actually partly owned by Queensland University. What they're doing is they have invented a gadget that they sell to a specific department in a hospital, right? Uh, so what they've done, that map, by the way, is a map for the, all the hospitals on the west, eastern side of the USA. What they're doing is they're selling, they've got data miners up there who are going into all of the websites of every, every hospital in the USA. They're going through and finding the person's name in the department that they want, they're going into the directories and getting their name. They're then criss crisscrossing that with other things like Facebook and LinkedIn and a few other ways of doing it. They then contact the client through a number of ways turn that cold contact into a warm leaf and hand it to an Australian who closes the side. That's quite a common uh, model, doing it through. This one's rather clever. This is a BPO that actually does uh, seat leasing now, 100% owned by the New Zealand Post. In New Zealand, uh, they've got an automatic mail centre in Auckland, and in the mail, they don't have a postcode system over there, so these um, parcels drop down a chute, and this camera's looking at the, at the thing, and as they drop down, it puts a barcode on the parcel, and as it goes through the cameras, they, the camera reads the address. And about 50% of the addresses that can't be read properly. That 50% that can't be read flick up on the screen in the Philippines. A little Filipino looks at the label and corrects the address. They have to do it in four seconds before it hits the first panel, North Island, South Island. And sit in that room watching them do that is absolutely amazing. So, seeing some pretty cool stuff up there. Reading x-rays. Uh, this is an American friend of mine who does this. Um, he's a radiologist. Um, Look, you can hire, what they were doing is they were hiring one, one radiologist at something like 120 grand a year, and they have a mistake margin, this will scare you, they have quite a high mistake margin on misreading x-rays, it's actually quite high, because one human being does it. So what they're doing now is they can hire three Filipinos for 12,000 each a year, right? Have all three of them read the same x-ray, use some computer software to match up the results. If all three of them agree on the result, they flick it straight back as 100% accurate at a third of the cost. Right. And we're seeing more and more of that. We're going to see a lot of medical stuff there where your blood goes in, it goes in and the Filipino reads, the, the camera takes a shot of it and the Filipino reads it. Yeah. So guys, that is some of the things that we're seeing. I think, um, Carl, I'll finish with this one. This is the last one I can. This one here's a Brisbane guy, actually. This is um, Shogun. Uh, if you guys have ever done car conversion left to right, one show you. Show you to be out of Brindale, Strathpine. They've been there for many, many years. They've got a range of agents through Australia. Uh, if you want to buy a big F450 Ram, they can buy it from the US, they bring it in, and they do the left to right conversion and put the compliance plate on. They were charging 45000 per conversion. They were at Strathpine. They had no profit. They had all sorts of problems there. The guy came up, had a look at Clark, loved the thing, came back, shut this factory down, put it all in a 40-foot container, went up. Today, by the way, mechanics up there are 8,000 paces a month, $46 a week for a mechanic. He's got 100 mechanics up there today. He charges $17,000 for conversion, right? He's now got a massive break profit as a result of that. But because he's up there, he's now selling them into Thailand, Singapore, and Hong Kong, and now the UK, and he's actually making more money out of that and still selling them back into Australia. He can move them through quicker through the shipping lines this way than he can from there. So that's a, that's a really good story of somebody there from Australia doing a really good job. So that's it. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Thank you very much. Good morning. A um, little bit about my story very quickly. Uh, as Nick just mentioned then, I started off in IT about uh, 15 years ago, and the 12 plus years of run businesses in IT. And my uh, experience with offshoring started maybe four or five years ago. Uh, and over a period of about three years, I experimented with pretty much every single position in my IT business. What can be done, what can't be done. That combined with a lot of research, finding out what was working for other people, what wasn't working, and why, led me to put together a brief impact that I was giving to friends, uh, involved in working consultancy and stuff like that. I ended up writing a book about it, uh, which is not a business book. Some of you might have read this already. This is because I believe that this is amazing and uh, a massive shift that's occurring in uh, global labour and the impacts that it's going to have on Australia. So my, my fundamental thinking here is what, what are parents going to help their kids choose when they go to uni to, and be confident that there's actually going to be a job at the end of when they finish their uni. So what I noticed, um, uh, the more that I explored this, was that there was a pretty high failure rate with the offshoring kind of stuff. 
And what I also found was that the people who were succeeding weren't really talking about it because they were getting a massive competitive advantage. And the people that were failing weren't really talking about it because they were pissed off and failing. So failure can mean something uh, extraordinarily explosive that happens. You know, for example, um, the provider they were using shuts down and then their, their business then grinds to a halt. But more often than not, it was meaning something around productivity. So uh, the, the, the team was up and running, but the productivity was so low, they had so many issues with attendance and stuff like that, that the business owners here were asking, well, is it even worth continuing over there? And these, so these are the main reasons that I found, and this is uh, why I decided that education was the way to help people succeed. Choosing the wrong model for housing your team is eight different ways to hire staff, some of those. Choosing the wrong uh, providers, uh, it's really hard to tell them to do a Google search for who's quality and who's not. Inadequate recruitment processes. This was a, it was a massive thing and a big part of my personal successes over there was finding good people has become a recruitment game and a retention staff retention game pretty quickly. So how do you get the good people? The facilities will all do it for you. No worries, give us your specs, we'll go and find you people. But they don't consistently find you the right people unless they have specialisation in an industry. So okay. So poor salary packaging, definitely paying um, too much and too little and Tweaking the way you do salary packaging can have a big impact on, on um, staff retention. What we think is a good way to structure a pack package in, salary package in Australia is a little bit different from what they think is a great salary package over there. Not a huge difference, but little, little differences. Paying too much or paying too little, you can waste into a retention problem there. If you don't know you're paying 20% under market value, um, obviously it's going to lead to retention problems. You want to be focusing in on and hiring the top 2% of people over there probably the same way you do here. So how do you keep those people you pay them really well? Unless it's really low, low skill stuff you're doing. Lack of cultural understanding, but it's very, uh, for those of you who have been there as well, you'll find it's a very familiar place to go. It feels very Western in nature. It doesn't feel challenging. And we easily make the assumption that people over there, their employees over there are the same as their employees here. And the reality is they're pretty close, but they're not the same. And uh, again, those little differences, um, uh, little things that you do differently with uh, management make a big difference to employee retention and productivity. Uh, particularly things around uh, understanding how important family is. Family is the most critical thing, way more than what it is here. So if you don't get that, really <coughs> and also around um, uh, the loss of face, which is an Asian uh, concept, but and it's it's not immediately apparent over there, but it really drives the way people behave. Uh, or internal cell, so the way you pitch this to your team here makes a big difference to your success and how many detractors. You've obviously got key players on your team, you don't want to lose them as a, as a result of uh, implementing an offshore team. And um, people on your, on your team here can get quite concerned or quite worried they're going to lose their jobs. So how do you address that is important. Poor integration to second location, so this is just uh, things like making sure the communications are right, how are those people going to connect in from an IT perspective, how are you going to make sure the call flow works properly, there's not delays on the line, um, how are you going to make sure that that team over there has the same, essentially the same culture as what your business does here. The basic stuff, uh, but important. Um, and going too fast with execution, and particularly around inadequate processes. So I see this for most businesses as a three year process. So you can go in there and you start, you find a point to start, and often that's the, the easy stuff, the low hanging fruit, where you can get some early financial gains uh, or enable you to grow the business in certain ways. But then you look, uh, ultimately, this is a process of refining your business to make it more uh, efficient. So you're pulling apart a three year period, you start to look at every single role in the business and pull it apart into tasks, and then look at what's the most efficient way to run this process. And you end up with positions that look very different uh, after few years to what they do in your business today, because you leverage low-cost people. And then poor management techniques. So ultimately, what I like to say is treat your offshore team like you treat your Australian team, and you need to tweak it with the, with the other few things that make a difference. Uh, yeah. So I might um, gave some information on why the Philippines, so I won't really go into that too much now. A couple of key points that perhaps you didn't touch on. If 
around so one of the things I get asked a lot in, um, in seminars is how long before the Philippines catches up to Australia in terms of wages, how long before everyone's just as expensive over there. And my answer is it's never going to happen. Um, uh, and here's essentially why. The population growth is quite steady. And we're talking about a country with 100 million people. Poverty is decreasing over there, and that's having the effect of seeing more university, uh, having more university graduates. Families, uh, for the first time, can afford to send their kids to uni. So that's putting more and more people back into the workforce. So the supply of skilled staff is actually increasing faster than the demand on that, and I think it will quite some time. So you see um, industry uh, variances, uh, <coughs> types of positions based upon how many people went to uni or that sort of thing. But we, you know, there's. 150,000 plus graduates a year coming out of university. And if the predictions in my book are correct, and we end up with a million roles shifting from Australia over there, a million roles is nothing compared to what they're turning out in terms of graduates. Obviously, other countries will, will uh, continue to increase their stuff in the Philippines as well. So, market supply is increasing faster than demand in terms of staffing, but on the other hand, you could say that average skill is probably lower than what we would expect. A couple of key reasons for that is a young population, you know, median age is 24, half the population is under 25, so you tend to be hiring young, much younger staff. And in that respect, they perform exceptionally well. They probably perform uh, better over there uh, for an equivalently aged person. But the point is, you've got a young workforce. If you can recruit older workers, uh, it's a great thing to do, especially focusing on the eldest daughter of the family. That's the one that traditionally uh, often uh, goes out to work early and uh, is responsible for helping the parents raise the rest of the kids. So they're highly responsible and they have a real sense of uh, a great work ethic. Uh, and also there's a historically narrow role. So um, most of the employees that, that you will hire have spent a lot of time working It's mostly for American companies uh, and they tend to be larger corporates who have very narrow roles. So this is the extent of things you do. You do this, these 10 tasks and that's all you ever do. Um, so you need to encourage them to, uh, at the boundaries of that role, to be discussing issues with you. Because they'll tend to go, well, that's not my issue, my, my role stops here. So there's some training involved in getting them up to speed. Um, one of the key things that I think really helped me early on was I zoomed in on how to find the best people. So uh, you can either hire people who um, you pour a lot of <coughs> or you can hire people who already have a high, a high amount of skill. Now those are hard to find. So you need to have a process that will help you find those people and to keep them when you get them. You still need to do some training and cultural adjustment regardless. So a few predictions coming up then. So I see this in terms of, sort of generations of the industry and how the industry is evolving. I'll talk a little bit about this in the book. It's some new stuff that I've been thinking about recently. I think the first generation of call centres that came through in the 1990s was pretty basic stuff. It was answering phones and making calls. A lot of it was outbound sales. So generation two, if you like, of um, the outsourcing, offshoring type stuff became more involved in different processes within the business. So it wasn't just about calls, it was about also customer service, uh, it was maybe about invoicing. It was you know, different lines of business, they call it, in these uh, BPOs, business process outsource facilities. BPO is also used as a catch-all phrase for the whole industry. Business process outsourcing is literally what it means. Generation three I see is being staff leasing. This is what Mike spoke about before. The key difference is that the client has a few has direct control over the hiring, firing, the salary, and the tasks. So with this generation two, you're basically taking a business process and giving it to someone else to do, and you pay for a result. Pay them a certain amount of money to deliver a certain result. 10,000 bucks a month if you want, you know, 1,000, 10,000 leads. That's how the contract works. Um, with the staff leasing, you actually have control over key points of that, which makes it much more appealing to the SMEs. Because we don't like giving control over a process, or indeed, the process may not have enough scale or enough documentation to hand it over to anybody. So that's become extremely popular and you know, I think that's going to continue to be popular. I don't think that these other generations of services are going to stop that being popular. Um, I think the issue with this, and that's kind of what, what was in the last, uh, the previous slide, on sort of the top 10 things that businesses do wrong, is the lack of understanding that the finer details of driving productivity, cultural recruitment, salary, packaging management, those sorts of things. Um, 
And as I also mentioned, I don't see this as being a cost saving thing. I see this as ultimately, for most of our businesses, being about re engineering the business to be actually more efficient in every, every part of what it does. The next generation, which is coming up now, it's already underway really, is these specialist facilities. So they sort of they look like seat leasing firms where someone provides you with an office space and some staff and you control everything that the staff member does, the same way you run your teams here in Australia, that's seat leasing. But these are specialist facilities. So they actually have deep industry knowledge. So an example of this is Nick Sinclair's business, which goes into the deep industry experience uh, around financial planning and accounting. So he's been in that space for well over 10 years. He understands what an accountant wants. So he can put not just a person in a seat, but add additional advantages around making sure that the recruitment is uh, it's high spec. Or would he actually want to hire in his own business? Therefore, he knows how to hire for other accounting firms or financial planners. Um, and then also add-ins like training. So uh, you can hire someone who is who has has the skills, but has say 90% of the skills that you want for that role. But filling in that extra 10% for the general seat leasing provider, that's your responsibility. So the training becomes really important and identifying that gap becomes really important. These types of facilities help fill in all of the gaps. So if you just hire someone that is ready to roll, they don't have something, you run them through a pre prepared training course that gives, them, gives you exactly what you want. So we're going to see a big rise in these sorts of things and I really think that the general seat leases that are out there that do everything are going to start to move in that direction as well and come up with divisions. We have specialist IT division, we have specialist accounting division, stuff like that. And then ultimately we're going into this global consolidation. So we, the next logical step from this is to have um, facilities which, you know, the, the back ends globally are pretty similar. So you look at IT for an example, and 80% of what IT service providers do the world around is the same. It's the same stuff. Um, we like to think it's different and amazing magic between our individual companies, but it's essentially the same. So some sort of consolidation where it's much more efficient for me to employ the entire or engage the entire back end uh, and I have the front end relationship with the client and do the integration with the client type approach. So I think we're going to see that happening in a lot of different industries. And if you like, it's kind of almost coming full circle. It's this, uh, uh, this process, business process outsourcing mixed with seat leasing with some very intelligent solutions and that lends itself to large scale aggregation across industries. Um, that's it. Thank you. Awesome. Morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the intro, Nick. Um, as Nick said, we went through that crazy process that Mike described, and more than everyone don't do it, and uh, and so that's what we did. <laughs> when I say we, I say uh, myself and my husband, Mark, who's here with us today. So we. Um, our journey was quite interesting. I went to the Philippines about a year ago and I could just see how dramatically um, things were going to change in the services industry in the next couple of years. So I owned a marketing agency and I went over there to see how I could save on costs, hire some great people, maybe rate my business to improve my profit margins. And what actually happened is I came out of that experience and, and after working with a few providers about three months later, I decided to be that crazy person that incorporates in the Philippines. Um, pretty young, pretty fresh, probably uh, a little bit gung ho. And so we started that process uh, in 2014. We opened our doors first of April, and we've got 100 staff. So what I wanted to share with you today is not just the BPO, but looking at the whole outsourcing and offshoring from $5 through to full time. So I'm going to take you on a really quick journey, pretty fast. What can you do with five bucks offshore? And what can you do through to full time? Um, and what would I recommend you do do and you don't do? Um, and I'll make these slides available. There's some things I'm not going to go through in detail, but there's some reference material there that you can check out later if it's of interest to you. And here we go. That way. <laughs> Cheap and cheerful. So let's start with five bucks. What do you get for five bucks when you want to outsource or offshore? Has anyone uh, been to five bucks? Check it out if you haven't, as the name suggests. Lots of fun for five bucks. So I use this quite frequently and I have changed the way that I engage with suppliers as a result of finding some fantastic suppliers through this resource. All over the world, you're talking to people that uh, can deliver services for you. Now I use this for um, animations, I use this for voiceovers, and I use this also for whiteboard videos. 
So to give you an example, in Australia, I used to use a voiceover talent at the Sunshine Coast, male and female, for a 30 second piece, let's say it's a radio ad, or let's say it's just for a white wood video, I pay 300 bucks. I now pay 30. And I can choose the accent that I want, I can have it delivered within 24 hours. It's just incredible. So, five bucks. My other tip is look for the five stars. So, you know, you have to kind of, with these suppliers, you have to test out what sort of quality you're going to get. And for five bucks or ten bucks, it doesn't work out who cares, right? You can test it out. So, you kind of hone in on those suppliers that are really going to deliver for you. Um, here's an example. This is one I did this week on Monday for EO. for um, five bucks. Can you help me play that? Mm -hmm. So this is an animation um, piece that we put at the beginning of the President's message for EO this month on the monthly newsletter. Design Crowd is another example um, of a site around 
$200 to $400. So what to use this for and what to not use it for? If you're building a $100 million company and your brand architecture is really important, don't use a tool like this. Go and see someone like Dolly who's an expert in creating brands that are going to basically reflect what you do and where you want to go and build a $100 million company. But if you have, let's say, a sales program and you want to rather like a little bit of internal do power and a goal that you have or something that you're doing quarterly and you want to you know, find a really fun brand or representation of this. This is great for creating internal, you know, internal logos, sales promotions, startups, budget type stuff. Um, you know, you might have a product and you might want to look at a, a new theme or refresh it. Perfect place to kind of brief that. You might want to take your logo and go, wow, I want to do something Christmassy because I want to do something fun in the office and with my customers. Perfect thing that you could brief there for a couple of hundred bucks that you can Christmas up your logo, for example. So there are limitations to how and why you would use a tool like this. Um, I'll just give you the slide pack so you can have a look at these top 10. Global freelancing. So, so both the guys have touched on this. I'm just going to touch on Odesk and tell you about my Odesk experience. So Odesk is a website where you access freelancers for everything. You can get them for you know, the simple stuff right through to complex and technical. Has anyone in the room used Odesk before? Great, quite a few of you. So the limitations, I've found it's great for low risk projects. It's fantastic for high repetition stuff like data mining or, or things that are going to require someone to do a lot of it a lot of the time. You don't want to bring something on iDesk if you've got any sort of unique IP. Because you don't know where it's going to go. If you guys are working from home, you've got no um, sort of measures around security. Um, so you, you basically can't protect your own head. Um, some of the te technical skills can be hit and miss. And I'll give you an example. I briefed something for um, a guy that used a tool called Prezi. It's like a presentation tool that kind of makes things really you know, funky and cool. It's the best way to describe it. <coughs> and he had examples of his work up on Odesk. Some really great presentations. And so I briefed him on the project and we got into it and I could tell from when we, when we started working together that that wasn't his work that he put up, it shows his work. So the technical skills can be really good and you can't skills test them before you start the project. You have to <coughs> hope that it's okay and then jump in. Times and consistency, if you're working with someone on the other side of the world then you're going to have two days delay instead of that one day giving feedback and consistency and reliability. So BPOs and KPOs, so this is staff leasing, seat leasing, this is what we've been talking about in a couple of weeks, the majority of the models that are over there. Um, I've broken it down into two parts, hourly and project and full time. So hourly and project, you get really little value on project work. Um, if you define the scope, so if you know what you want, you can go in and have someone engage on a project and it's, it's probably going to work quite well because that's what the experience. Hourly rates are flexible and you pay for what you need. And the reliability and security. So typically, there's you know you've got security in place, you've got IT architecture, you've got office managers and supervisors. So where this can fall, fall down, I'll give you an example. I'll give you a bookkeeping example. I had a bookkeeper in a uh, you know accounting specialist firm in Manila about a year ago, and what I found out at the time after I got to know her is that she was actually working across three time zones. She was working for us in Australia. She was working for a US company. She was also working um, for a UK company. So she could work up to a 16 hour day. And I didn't know that. It was great for flexibility because I didn't need a part time bookkeeper. But in the, in the company that she was working for, she was actually working 16 hours. Um, and of course, she got burnt out. And six months later, she resigned. And we had 10 days notice. And we had to do a knowledge transfer to someone who was not our staff member that we didn't have control over because she was unemployed. So there is a limitation to that, to that kind of hourly engagement and you have to be aware of the risks associated with that. Full time. So full time is, is probably, for the majority of companies, my recommendation is, is to look to see if you can pull a full time position together rather than having part time or hourly because you have a lot more control. Um, so then you all staff, you're in control of recruitment, training and development. Um, increased opportunities for volunteer retention, transparency of wages, so if you've got a 
with the provider, they will actually tell you what they're going to pay the staff, rather than on hourly, you don't know what your staff is going to pay. And on hourly, the lower the staff wages are, the more money the provider makes. So transparency is really important. Office management I've spoken about. Excellent returns long term. It's not a quick win. You don't put a bum on a seat in a month and expect it to be working perfectly. You have to invest in training and development just like you would in Australia. The downside is the lack of flexibility, so it does need to be full time or close to it. And you need to invest some time and probably get over there and do some travel and, and spend some time face to face with yourself. Nearly done. Top tips um, with respect to any sort of outsourcing or offshoring skills test. You cannot prove that your staff member can do the job, then don't, don't do it. Ask for skills test. If the provider that you're working with can't give you a skills test, then you need to create one to make sure that the person that's working on the job is <coughs> Look for agility and Western experience. I found in the Philippines the staff who work best with Australian clients have worked for Western companies before. If they've only worked in a Filipino company before, they will struggle. They'll struggle with agility, they'll struggle with change, and they'll struggle with culture. Training will take as much time as it does in Australia. Sometimes one and a half, depending on the, the technical aspect of the job. So you just you need to think about that. It's a common thing, all the guys have spoken about it. Get your processes sorted before you outsource. So if they're not right before you outsource, they're not going to get any better when you take your vote these. Um, define the roles and tasks in advance. Test for understanding for tasks back on communication. So don't ask for, uh, for questions yes or no, did you understand it? Ask a question like, can you tell me the 10 steps that you're going to do now to achieve that? So you have to be really, really mindful of your questioning when you're working with staff. Use tools like Snagit to record your remote, remote testing. So if you're testing remotely, you can use a tool to record your audio and record your screen share so you start back to it later. Um, and look for providers with similar business values. If your provider can't tell you about the values that are important to them and their people, and you can look at what's important for you in your business and your team and your people, then somewhere you're going to struggle. Because outsourcing is a long-term investment. It's not about quick wins, it's not short term. So you do need to find a provider that you can work with and have a really good relationship with. I think that's me. I've seen walked into his office and it's like I've been in Australia. And I was gobsmacked at how Australianised a lot of the business mm -hmm. there. I walked past a the bank, some Port Bank, Goodyear. Um, I walked past a Gold Coast law firm on base of the Gold Coast and I walked past a that point it's lost from the Gold Coast and they're like, oh yeah, they've got 50 people in there. Like, you never hear about these sorts of things. So it really opened my eyes up. I, quickly was speaking to, to my regularly went back over and did his tour about a year later after it was set up. He chucked people into Microsoft and straight away. Um, had 10 people in there, had some really good and bad experiences with that. Um, and then we ended up setting up that new corporate AI business, which is the part I'm going to talk about today. Because a lot of people um, will now go on tours of Mike and Scott and I had an account last week with me and said, look, I'm incorporating next week. Can you recruit for me? Can you train them? Can you link us with the university where you get all your graduates from? Can you get your IT guys to set all of ours up? And I said, can you get lost? <laughs> um, I'm not going to do everything for you so that you can set up and do it yourself. We incubate some businesses to do it. They have scales of wanting to grow to a certain size. Um, it's not all rosy. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you kind of find out after it's happened. Um, and we've been operating now for 12 months. We just had our renewal of our local licences and they came into us with something that is new legislation that was applied last week but we now have to retrospectively do it. So we now have to go back and do all these things um, and it has to do with health and safety of desk space. Now our desk space are twice the size of the legal requirement and we're about 30 centimetres wider but they wanted an engineer's plan with a sign-off from an engineer saying that the desk space was sitting in the exact position that they actually were in the office. I mean, that's ridiculous. But to get the certificate, you have to do it. Um, and they can just pop up and things like that. So we started the journey and, um, in October. So everyone says that the incorporation process is quick. If you ring the local council over there or you speak to some of the providers over there, they'll say you can do it in 
in six weeks. Now, I can tell you now, it's not going to happen. I mean, I spoke to the, 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 our local government pretty much every week, and we've got friends of our staff that are in there, and it still doesn't help the process. So we started in October. Um, to get around that, we actually leased space that we took over from December. Because we thought the process was that quick, we, like I do, is jump the gun. I said, great, we'll start recruiting, we'll get people on board, we'll lease the office, we'll take it over, we'll be incorporated by then, we'll be okay. And we'll just learn as we go. Um, so one of my mates who has an accounting business in, in Manila um, got me through the back entrance. You could say uh, advertising on Job Street, which is the equivalent of Seek. Um, you have to be an incorporated entity to, to advertise on it, but if you know someone in there, you can get around that. So we advertised for that. Um, we got our first um, eight team leaders in on board. So we recruited our, we started with our structure where we want the managers so we can train them for a month solid, and then we'll bring the rest of the team on in January. And our initial goal was to flip the <coughs> process in Australia so that <coughs> Australia was client facing, everything else is process orientated and generally takes three to 12 months to do things, gets put overseas. Um, we, all, we put them on a contractual basis, so they were actually contracting to our Australian company. They weren't contracting to any local company because we didn't have one at that stage. We, we started the office lease, um, and it was a handshake agreement with me and the guy that owns the business part. Because we weren't incorporated, we're not actually allowed to occupy space. So if the local government came by, we were doing a week by week rent on a temporary basis, and we just, they were the words we had to use if we got inspected. Um, we weren't actually in an official arrangement with it, although we had signed contracts with the start date of 1 December, which we had to supply to the local council to get approval, but it didn't officially start until they say it can start. But we did occupy the premises from December. Now, one of the things that we didn't realise. I wanted to do with this big brother is that we put cameras everywhere at the office because I wanted to be able to, in Australia, sit at my desk and go, Mary, sit down and start talking, do your work. Now, I did that a few times and they realised that we did look, but it's actually a local government requirement that you have to have cameras in your office for their safety and you have to have biometrics on your doors for their safety. So we started a conversation around, um, it's not about us watching you, it's us making sure that you're okay. And you know, the perception of how you position it with your staff is taken a different way. It's a local government requirement. That's what, in the end of the day, it is a requirement you have to have. But a lot of people, when they set up offices, don't actually realise you have to have that stuff. You have to have a certain amount of fire extinguishers and, and all this sort of stuff. If you don't have it, um, they can shut you down and they don't tell you. They don't walk in and say, Nick, you're missing this fire extinguisher, you're missing this. They'll basically say, we're going to shut you down unless you have this done in the next hour. So you need to actually have people with knowledge give you the advice before you just go through it. Because otherwise you'll be up and running, you think it's all crazy, and then some of you just get absolutely pinged. And once you come up on their radar once, and you're a Westerner, they'll keep coming back. They're not gonna leave you alone. So we onboarded a staff in January with 22 people. Um, we didn't get it right when we started outsourcing. So when we first started outsourcing, we never went to the Philippines. So for two years we had staff in Microsoft, and we never went there once. Um, our training was that we just trained over Scott. We had no training videos. Our processes we thought were good. Um, and what we realized is that we were training them how to do the job without them having the knowledge of why they're doing the job. So they understood what a superannuation fund was, but they didn't understand why people have super funds. And there's a big difference, and we found that. Now we have a training division which we teach them first why people have superannuation funds, how the Australian environment works, and then they get trained on how to do the actual process. But now we have a training video, which you know, I only put up on the software, there's heaps of Camtasia, screen capture. You start for doing the job anyway, you might as well press record and film them doing it, because then when you start, remember, you get the work back and you review it and say, look, this is wrong, and you can say, watch the video, you then get that transcripted, then it's a written process, and then you do a mud map. Now you've suddenly got pretty good training material, and it takes about five minutes to do it. It doesn't take long to build that, but if you don't have that training material, they're going to say to you, do you understand what you're doing? Yes, sir. And then you say, oh, I'll go and do it, and then they'll be flandering, and then now later you go, where is the work? Oh, I don't understand, sir. So you told me you understand. So at least you can say, look, do it, have a go at it, review it, send it back and say, watch the video, learn from your mistakes, 
um, read the process again and have another go. You don't actually have to physically retrain them every time because it is an investment in training. They're very, very educated, they're very, very diligent, and they're probably, for our staff, they produce a lot more than our Australian staff, but you have to invest the time in it. And we didn't do that right when we first started. We didn't actually get incorporated into February, so that was some five months later, and I was told it was a six week process. Um, and it does take time, and we still have more hurdles. You can't officially open a bank account over there until you're incorporated, unless your HR manager knows the bank manager. <laughs> so I've got an official post office box over there. I've got an, I'm, in essence, I've got all the material over there to get a local bank account. And there's ways you can do it and <coughs> legally um, to get a bank account. But if you walk into the bank and say, well, I want to set up a bank account, they'll say you can't do it. Now that's technically not right, but it's just too hard for them to do it. And I want to explain to you, you have to go and do this, this, and this together. So you can open bank accounts, you can operate and do things, you just need to understand how to do it. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about lawyers because there is some Western lawyers over there that are charging 10 grand to do things for local lawyer will charge thousand dollars to do. Um, we rebranded, we quickly learned um, our brand was very similar to another um, brand. So in Australia we're running MyPad People as a brand, which is a subset brand of uh, well farms. When people do a Google search, you get a lot of from my. It's all come up as number one, and then come up as number two on the brand. We just automatically applied that brand overseas, but it was very aligned with cloud stuff, which a lot of people don't avoid. So our staff were getting confused with their staff. So people would come in and say, look, I thought I went for an interview with you guys three weeks ago. Well, I would no, we're here, and they're over there in Angeles. So we just rebranded and, and really got the confusion out of what we do. Um, we've grown to 98 staff in a, in a quick amount of time, but I learned a lot of things about recruiting, and Scott was spot on. You can recruit, like we can have 50 people apply for a job, but I'd actually only want to employ probably three or four of them. So our experience with um, Microsoft and when we went through them was they had a lot of accounts they put in front of us. None of them had got skill testing accounting. They just put people in front of us. What we then found when we were in their system is that they recycled their staff around around clients. And again, this is only my experience. I have mates that have had a very good experience with my business. So I don't want to sound negative, but we just found that it was recycled junk um, as opposed to someone that's been skill test, trained in Australian tax and with us and has good quality um, for what we wanted to do. So our experience wasn't great. Um, again, I was naive. I thought with nine staff there and we're going to 30 staff, we could do it and it wouldn't be any hassle. You know, Mike did warn me a hundred times it was difficult um, for the person. Um, I just thought it would be easy going to incorporate. So look, we've learned a lot and the process is doable, um, but you need to invest the team going over there. So we have someone there um, every month from our Australian office. Um, I know a lot of guys here do have business, so they'll be, David, I've seen more photos of you in the Philippines than I have in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Jamie, one of my forum mates, is living over there three weeks um, every month. One of my other forum mates is just about to move there for six months, and I know a few other guys have moved over there for six months. You need to invest your time <coughs> to build your culture over there. And I'll jump through to that part um, very quick. Oh, so our aim is to go to 1,000 people, which I thought at the start was a lot, um, but it's not. So some of the key steps is get a great local lawyer to do it. Don't deal with a Western company that is starting to incorporating them. They quoted us 10 to 12 grand, and they did one of my mates, and they absolutely stuck them. We used a local lawyer. The Angeles town is named after his family. They own three universities. He's the head of the CPA, although he's a lawyer. He knows everyone in the area. Again, Mike referred us to him. Um, 1500 bucks, full incorporation, and manage the whole process. He's now our corporate secretary, so he signs up all the documents when I'm not there. And that's the key thing. You need someone that can do that for you. Um, you need to be there at the start. My Amy was basically lived there in the home market, and Amy lived there for almost three months during the <coughs> process. I was there every two weeks because there are thousands of documents you have to sign. Whenever you open a bank account, you sign 50 pages of the same document. They don't have technology. Um, you need to get involved in the local community as well. You can't just go in there 
and be a typical Western and, and American business that comes in, they see it as just taking the money. You need to really ingrain in the local community. Now we um, went and fed a whole town, I think it cost us 200 bucks. We organised the gymnies, there were 60 staff went down there, they fed the town for the day, there was lineups of kilometres long of people coming up to get their bags and stuff. So you need to really get involved in the community. Don't just go over there and treat it as and get to the start. Get involved in it. Um, and it's a great culture. The things you can do there um, and the benefits you can, what you can actually contribute compared to what you could here is phenomenal. Um, this is the big one that I'll finish on. I got told time and time again that you need Western managers there. And I can tell you now that our experience has been that that's the opposite. Um, I've studied a lot of the biggest PPOs over there, and some of the ones that have 20,000 plus staff, they have very minimal Western staff. I sat next to a guy on the plane two weeks ago coming back from Manila. Um, his outsourcing firm that he works for have 130,000 globally, they have 35,000 in Manila alone. They have two Westerners in Manila. They started with six five years ago. Their strategy is within five years they don't want any Westerners in there because they reckon we, we do worse. Um, and I'll talk around why. Um, have a schedule for your Australian team to go there. Don't not go there, but let the local run it. So how do we do this in our office? So we have an English only. They cannot speak local in our office. While they're at work, they speak English because they're working for an Australian New Zealand BPO. That's our rules. Their English becomes very, very good in a short amount of time because they have to speak it and have to buy it all day. Um, our office is decorated with all this stuff everywhere. When you walk in, there's flags everywhere on the, on the poles with all the electrical cables, there's koalas, we give them that crappy beach in mind. Um, we really, really induct them into Australia and they feel like they're work, working in an Australian environment. So whether you're in a BPO or whether you have your own, you need to make them feel part of our home. If they're working for us and they're doing work for our clients, they need to understand this. Um, we have a very detailed induction process.